run everywhere faster than it takes to get in a car. Um, but yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come here today um, and appreciate Max Cycles for hosting. Um, I'll try and keep this relatively short, but with everything I like to go long, so if I see you guys at the back kind of nodding off, I'll take it as an indication that I need to shut up and, and start signing. So I guess, I mean, can everyone hear me? Is, it, is the sound okay? Um, what I thought is that I'd talk for maybe about 20 minutes, um, give you a bit of background about me. I know a lot of you know more about me than I probably know about me. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll fill in the gaps of, um, of the information that you don't know. Then I thought I'd talk a little bit about what I see as my greatest um, sporting achievement and then talk briefly about why I wrote the book that hopefully uh, some or all of you have got in your hands. Um, and then I thought we'd finish off just by opening the floor to maybe five or six questions. And then I hope to have the opportunity to um, sign um, all of you guys' books and interact with all of you on, on, a, on a much more personal level. And that really is a huge privilege and an amazing opportunity. So I want to extend my thanks to you for enabling me um, to do that. So just, just to start off with a, a bit of background, um, I, I was always a sporty kid. Um, I was always very, very self-motivated, very driven very determined, some would say obsessive, compulsive, no, not me. Um, but I channeled all of that kind of obsessive, compulsive behavior into my academic studies. So what was really important was that I um, fulfilled my potential academically. So sport was something that I did very much for fun, um, something to, you know, to see my friends and focus very much on, on, on that social side. And I carried that philosophy all the way through um, to university. Um, I joined the swimming team there and I drank for them very, very successfully. Um, I was less well known for my swimming prowess, actually, and if I, if I trained once a week, it was an absolute miracle and the coach fell over himself um, with excitement. Um, after university, I graduated with my, my undergraduate degree and I thought at that point I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, and I thought before I embarked on, on, my, on my career, this is quite exciting, I'm getting fiddled with it. <laughs> it's one of the perks of the job. Um, yeah, so I thought before I embarked on, on my career in law, um, I'd go traveling. I thought I'd go for, for nine months. Two years later, I return. Um, but it was while I was traveling that I met a woman that was to change the direction that my life would take. Um, I met her in Africa, her name, was, her name was Jude, and she said something very simple to me. She said, Chrissy, look deep inside yourself and work out what your passion truly is. And I had to say, I'd never really done that before. And I looked inside myself, as she suge suggested, and I, I realized that my passion ever since I, I grew up uh -oh, so I, ever since I'd, I'd um, been a child was, was development, international development. Not that I knew it as that as a child, I just knew it as caring passionately um, about the world around me and wanting to uh, try and affect positive change and find a solution to, to the many problems that afflict our world. So when I came back from traveling, I started my master's in development economics. And it was during um, my masters that I needed um, some kind of mental release um, but while I was traveling I'd also gained a little bit of weight and I'd kind of gotten a little puffy um, so I thought the best way to lose this puff was to start running so I just stuck 20 minutes 25 minutes 30 minutes um, and I got talking to a friend and she'd run the London Marathon the year before and she'd grown up with a heart defect and I took a look at her and I thought to myself, well, if she can do it, what's, what's stopping me? Next day, I enter the London Marathon. I have absolutely no clue about running training. I just put on my secondhand sneakers, my kind of old baggy t-shirt that I had traveling, and I just go out and run for the same time, the same, you know, the same distance, the same route every day. Um, nevertheless, that um, kind of obsessive compulsive training seemed to pay off and, and I ran the London Marathon in 2002 and managed to do uh, 3.08. Um, 
then I started to take running a little bit more seriously. Um, I moved down to London. I got what was my absolutely dream job. I started working for the government, the UK government. I was a policy advisor on international development policy. Um, and I combined this with, with my run training. So I joined a, joined a running group, um, started running a little bit more seriously, got injured, um, and uh, started swimming a little bit again. 2004, someone said to me, Chrissy, why don't you try a triathlon? Hmm. What's a triathlon? <laughs> Swim, bike, and run. No. <laughs> Never ridden a road bike. Doesn't matter, Chrissy, it's fine, we'll lend you a road bike. So they lend me a road bike, which I still have. It's kind of black and yellow, and looks like a bumblebee, and cost me about $300. Um, and I set about learning how to, to ride it, and I entered a, a few sprint triathlons, which were pretty mediocre at best. Um, and at that point, I was getting kind of disillusioned with my job. I loved my job, but it was kind of this high-level policy making, and what I wanted to do was work in development practice on the ground. So I found myself a job um, in Nepal. I was managing water and sanitation projects out in, in Kathmandu and in, in, the, in the Himalayas for an amazing $80 a month. Um, and when I wasn't uh, working and making a huge amount of money, I, um, I was biking. So a few days after I arrived, I bought myself another second-hand uh, bike, which I named uh, Prem, which is Nepali for, for boyfriend. Um, we spent a lot of time together. I rode him every day. Um, <laughs> sorry for the children listening. Um, I'll keep it clean from now on. Um, so myself and Prem and some of the Nepali guys and some Western friends I made before work every day, we'd go riding um, in the Kathmandu Valley. Um, weekends we'd do the same but much longer. Holidays, of which there are many in Nepal, we just go on these even longer adventures, either hiking, trekking in the Himalayas, or on our bikes. And one of, one of the amazing adventures we had was to um, go to Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, and we decided to cycle all the way back to Kathmandu, um, all at 15,000 foot, um, 1,400 kilometers via Everest Base Camp. Uh, the most amazing experience of my life. And, Whilst I think the physical strength of training, um, uh, altitude does leave you after a while. I think the mental strength I gained from um, the physical activity I did there still, still stays with me. But this wasn't training as we know training and that I had a program and a structure. We just went out and we rode. We didn't care about heart rates, we didn't care about power, and I still don't. Um, we just went up and down the hills and fell off, and nothing's changed there. Um, and just loved sport for sport's sake. It was sport at its rawest, and I absolutely loved it. So, I come back to the UK, this is 2006, and I think, right, I'm going to give triathlon a really good go. So I enter the Redditch Super Sprint triathlon, which um, turned out to be very, very sprint-like in it, that it lasted about 10 seconds, but wasn't particularly super. Um, so, I borrow a wetsuit the day before the race. Don't wear anything new on race day. Um, so I borrow a wetsuit, total novice, put the wetsuit on, da -da -da, feels really good. Um, okay, this is fine, I think, to myself. I jump in the 14 degree not-so-tropical water in the UK in May, and um, the wetsuit floods with this freezing cold water. Bang, gun goes off. I try and swim, find that I can't even get my arms out of the water, sink, have to be rescued by a kayaker. <laughs> this is six years ago. Um, yeah, May 2006. Um, not auspicious beginnings. Um, next race went, um, went much better. I got a wetsuit that fitted me. I learned how to clip in and out for my pedals. I managed to win that race and gained uh, my qualification for the World Amateur Championships, which were to be held in, in Switzerland uh, in September that year. So I trained really, really hard, juggled the, the practically full-time training with my full-time job, again, working for the government. And I went to Switzerland um, never envisaging that I would win that race. And, and I did just that. And 
I knew upon winning the World Amateur Championships um, September 2006 that I had a big decision to make and that was whether or not to, to leave my job um, and become a professional triathlete and for me it was a huge decision. It was a job that I loved. I absolutely loved my job. Um, I was, I was scared and I was fearful of the unknown. I was fearful of not being able to make a success of triathlon. I was scared of not being able to make a living out of, out of the sport. But I think we're, you know, we're all fearful. You know, we're fearful of, of, of failure. Um, we're fearful of the unknown. Um, we're fearful of what we look like in Lycra. And we can either let those fears stop us or we can face them. And I'm not the sort of person to want to look back and ever think, what if? I never want to be left wondering. So although I was incredibly apprehensive, I knew nothing about professional sport and professional triathlon. I knew um, that I had to take this, this chance and seize it with both hands. So in, in February 2007, I gave up my job, excuse me, I gave up my job and became um, a professional athlete. And I did so only with the attention of focusing on Olympic distance. I distinctly remember saying that Ironman was something that really, really crazy people did. <laughs> mm, not me. Um, that was until my, my coach, in his infinite wisdom, uh, decided that I would be doing the outdoors long course triathlon whilst not an Iron Man in length, definitely um, Iron Man like in intensity. It's a um, 115 mile bike which finishes with the famous climb up outdoors and then we run 22k at altitude at, at the top. Um, absolutely masochistic. I loved every minute of it. Um, and at the finish line, my, I remember my coach saying to me, Chrissy, you know, do you want to do an Iron Man? And all I said to him was, Am I ready? Said, yep. Um, five weeks later, I'm on the start line of Ironman Korea with my road bike, my clip-on bars, my, my regular wheels. Um, I was so tight with money at that point that I wouldn't even invest in a race kit. So I borrowed my race kit off my, my teammate, uh, Rebecca. I wouldn't even invest in a swim skin to go over that race kit. So in the non-wetsuit swim, I just wore my bathing suit over the top. Um, but what I lacked in image, I made up for <laughs> in effort. And I managed to, to win my first Ironman race, much to my surprise, and gave my slot for, for the World Championships in 2007 in, in, in Kona. And I, I remember standing on the finish line of, of Korea, and I was on the phone, and I phoned to Brett, and I said, Brett, 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 I've won, I've won, I've won, I've won. Um, and Brett's very effusive with his praise, so he said, good job, kid. Yeah. That's an Aussie accent for those that uh, didn't distinguish that. Um, so yes, good job, kid. And so then I knew I'd done an amazing job. Um, and I said, but Brett, I've got my slot for Kona, but it's $500. And you've got to remember, I wouldn't even invest in a race kit. I was wearing secondhand shorts at that point. He said, look, Chrissy, just pay the money and then we've got the slot if we want to use it. Um, six weeks later, I'm on the start line of, of the biggest race in, in our sporting calendar, which is the World Championships in, in Kona. Um, my measure of success going into that race would, would have been to, to have um, squeezed into the top 10. If I'd have done that, then it would have been a, a phenomenal result for me. Um, to, to win that race and cross that finish line in first place was the most surreal, surprising, amazing experience of my entire life. Um, and it was the moment that, that really changed my life forever. Um, but it was so surreal. I remember I was running down the finish line, this kind of crazy flag-waving, smiley British person that no, none of the commentators knew. Um, who I was, and all I could hear was, well, I could hear the crowd, but then I heard this, mm. I just, it's not, it wasn't a cow, actually. It was um, the Hawaiians blowing into this conch shell, but 